Oh yeah, it did kind of look like that, but not quite like that. Let's go to the next one. Hmm. Oh, hey everyone. Squeaks and I just got back from our new favorite hobby, bird watching. Bird watching is when you grab a pair of binoculars, go outside, and well, watch birds. Some people travel all over the world to look at different birds and try and see as many different species as they can. And bird watching can also be good for the birds. People watching birds can help keep track of how many birds there are in a habitat and look out for anything that could be dangerous to them. <laughs> You're right, Squeaks. Bird watching is really cool. Today, just around the fort, we saw a ton of birds. We saw wood ducks swimming in a pond, some quail, a crane standing in the river, and even a huge osprey. We also saw lots of little songbirds, but we weren't sure what all of them were called, so we came back here to look them up on the fort's computer. Ah, Squeaks has a great question. Why do songbirds sing so much anyway? Well, there are a lot of reasons and Jesse told us all about them in this video. Hi there, Squeaks and I were just outside bird watching and there are so many different kinds of birds. Some, like the Northern Cardinal, can sing beautiful songs. Just listen. We call birds that sing like this songbirds. Lots of birds sing for different reasons, and for songbirds like cardinals, singing is an important way for them to talk to each other. Cardinals will chirp and chitter all year long, but in the spring, they bring out their loudest and prettiest songs. Why do they sing so much in the spring? They're getting ready to raise their babies. Like most animals you know, cardinals are usually either a boy called a male or a girl called a female, and they're pretty easy to tell apart. Male cardinals are bright red, and female cardinals are brown. And both male and female cardinals sing, often for different reasons. But during the spring, they both sing much more than they usually do. You see, in the springtime, cardinals are getting ready to build a nest, lay eggs, and raise little baby birds. But they can't do it alone. They need to find a mate, another cardinal, to help them feed and protect their babies. A male cardinal wants to become a dad. so. When spring comes around, he usually starts looking for a female mate to have and raise babies with. He'll start singing and hope that a female cardinal will hear his song. But showing a female cardinal that he'll be a good dad takes a lot of work. Female cardinals want to find a mate who's strong and smart, who can find lots of food, and who can protect their babies from other animals that might want to eat them. So the male cardinal has to show that he's tough enough to protect his new family. And the best way to do this is to sing loudly. By singing loudly, a male cardinal says, here I am and I'm not afraid of anything. He knows that other cardinals can hear him, but there are also other types of animals listening too. Ones like hawks or cats that might want to eat him. So his loud song shows that he isn't even afraid of getting eaten. Male cardinals will even try to sing louder than other males who might be nearby to prove that they're the toughest bird around tough enough to be a great dad. Now, to call out to female birds, male cardinals sing a special song called a mating call. This song is different from his normal song. It's meant just for the female. A female that's nearby will want to see which brave male is singing his mating call, so she can decide if she wants to raise her babies with him. If she likes his song, she'll let him fly over and they'll pair up for the spring. Now, it's not just the males that sing. Female cardinals will also sing more in the spring, too. Females learn different songs than the males, and scientists are still trying to learn what the females are saying. Maybe someday we'll be able to understand everything these amazing birds are saying to each other. Until then, we're just lucky that we get to enjoy their special springtime songs. Squeaks, what kind of song would you sing if you were a bird? That's a great bird song, Squeaks. Here's mine. And you know, Squeaks, not all birds just sing either. Some birds can talk. Exactly, like parrots. Let's check out this video to remember how and why they and lots of other birds can learn human words. Hmm, Squeaks, do you know a word for a really smart bird? A parrot, you're right. 
I just love words, and some birds do too. Just like us, birds can use sounds and body language to communicate with each other. And when we make sounds to communicate, we usually use language. Language is made of words like I and store and bananas put together into sentences like I'm going to the store to buy some bananas. But almost all other animals don't use language to put words into sentences like we do, except for some birds. When birds like parakeets or hill minas or African gray parrots spend time with humans, they start to repeat our human sounds back to us. You can even train them to say things you want them to repeat. Great question, Squeaks. Do they really understand what they're saying or are they just copying the sounds they hear? Well, it might be a little of both. Birds can be very impressive at imitation, which is another word for copying. When chicks are born, they hear sounds made by the other birds in their flock or their family, and they practice imitating those sounds until they sound just like the rest of their flock. There are lots of reasons that birds might need to know the sounds that other animals make. For one thing, birds in the wild are very social. They help out other members of their flock. The calls of different flocks of birds, even two different flocks of the same kind of bird, are all different from each other. It helps them to know who their family is by the familiar sounds they make. Some birds can even learn other animal calls that might scare away predators so the birds don't get eaten. And being good at imitating shows that a bird is smart and has a good memory and strong muscles, which makes it more appealing to other birds in its flock. The birds that can copy human speech are especially talented imitators. Birds that learn to imitate humans come from two groups. Parrots like African greys, cockatoos, and parakeets, and songbirds like minas, starlings, and even crows. They're such good imitators that sometimes they can even fool people. Some pet birds have escaped into the wild and taught the calls they learned from humans to the other birds in their new flock. So sometimes people have gone for a nature walk and heard someone calling out. They looked around for a person only to realize that the birds were the ones talking. When pet birds copy the way we talk, that might be because they think of the humans they live with as their flock, and birds want to sound as much like their own flock as they can. Plus, if a parrot gets a treat every time they say something that sounds like the human members of their flock, they'll want to keep practicing their human sounds. These birds can learn hundreds of words, especially if they're trained from an early age by a human. Alex, a very famous gray parrot, learned the words for over a hundred different things. His trainer even taught him to ask for these objects when he wanted them. And learning to say, I want a banana, when you want a banana, sure sounds like language, doesn't it? Well, it is a form of communicating. Alex knew that making certain noises would make something happen. Like if he made the sounds for, I want a banana, he would get one. But it's not exactly the same as language. What's special about human language is not just that we use words to communicate. We can say, I want a banana, and so can some birds if they've been trained by humans. But human language can take a bunch of ideas and use them together in one thought. So not just saying, I want a banana, but before you can have a banana, first you need to wash your hands and set the table. Animals can have complicated ways of communicating, but they don't use what we think of as language to do it even if they're repeating human words. Looking at birds around the fort is great, but like I said earlier, some people travel all over the world to go bird watching and see birds they couldn't see close to their homes. If you could go anywhere and see any type of bird you wanted to, what would it be? Oh wow, Squeaks would want to go to Africa to see ostriches. That's a great answer, Squeaks. Even though they're big and sort of weird looking, ostriches are birds. In fact, they're the biggest birds in the world. So big, you probably wouldn't need binoculars to see them, huh Squeaks? Guess what we saw this morning? Sure, you go ahead and tell them, which birds did we see? You're right, we saw a bunch of crows and a hawk, and we even saw a tiny hummingbird zipping around. I think it'd be fun to fly like those birds too, Squeaks, but with all those beautiful birds out there, I also love birds that can't fly, especially ostriches, huge birds that live in Africa. Ostriches can grow to be two meters or six feet tall. That's taller than most grown-ups. I know, that's one big bird. And I bet you can guess why they can't fly. It's because they're so huge. Their wings aren't strong enough to lift them into the air. They're just too heavy. Instead, 
Ostriches are built for life on the ground, and they use their legs to get around. It helps that ostriches have some of the most impressive bird legs out there. When they need to get somewhere quickly, they can run up to 70 kilometers an hour, or 45 miles an hour. That's faster than cars drive down some streets. Ostriches normally walk along the ground looking for plants and seeds to eat. But if a predator that wants to eat them gets too close, they can run away really fast. Oh, Squeaks wants to know how many other birds don't fly. While most birds do fly, there are 50 kinds of birds that get around by walking or swimming instead. We talked about some of them once. Penguins, remember Squeaks? Instead of flying, penguins waddle around on land. But what they're really good at is swimming through the water. Not being able to fly really changes things for a bird. But even though flightless birds move differently, Ostriches and flying birds still have a lot in common. Can you think of anything, Squeaks? That's right! Ostriches still lay hard eggs, just like other birds. Ostrich eggs are some of the biggest in the world. They're bigger than a softball. If I had one here, it would barely fit in my hand. Instead of making a nest in a tree, ostriches lay their eggs on the ground and keep them safe by staying close and scaring away any predators that might want to eat their eggs. What other things do ostriches and other birds have in common, Squeaks? That's right! Ostriches still have wings and feathers. Instead of using their wings to fly, ostriches use them for balance while they run so they don't fall over. Their feathers are also a bit different from other birds. If you look closely, the feather is a bit spread out, so it's very fluffy and light. Those feathers make an ostrich's wing look kind of like a big paper fan, like this one. And it works the same way. When ostriches are too hot, they can fluff up their feathers and this can fan away hot air. See, we can use this fan just like an ostrich uses its fluffy feathers. Whew, I could use a chance to cool down after sharing all this awesome animal knowledge with you. Would you rather be a flying bird like a crow or a sparrow, or a flightless bird like a penguin or an ostrich? What bird would I want to travel to see? Hmm. Oh. I know. I've seen them in zoos lots of times, but I've always wanted to see flamingos in their natural habitat. And a lot of times, the flamingos in zoos can't fly, but they can in the wild. I'd love to see hundreds of flamingos take off at the same time. I bet that would be really cool. In fact, now I'm in the mood to watch our video about flamingos. Let's check it out, Squeaks. Wow. Isn't that awesome? Oh. Hi there, Squeaks and I were just doing a little bird watching. It's so much fun to try to spot different birds. Today, we saw a cardinal, a goldfinch, and a blue jay. Good observation, Squeaks. Squeaks noticed that all of the birds we saw today were different colors. The cardinal was red, the goldfinch was yellow, and the blue jay was, well, blue. <laughs> it's one of the reasons I think birds are interesting. They're so different from one another. Some, like the ones we saw, are brightly colored, while others are less colorful. Some birds, like this mother mallard duck and its ducklings, have feathers that are brownish, and that's a good thing. Their feathers help the birds to blend into their marshy surroundings, making them harder to see. This helps them to hide from predators that might want to eat them. But birds with bright feathers are much easier to spot, and those bright colors might help birds to recognize one another or find a mate to lay eggs with. Good question. Squeaks wants to know what makes some birds so colorful. The answer is, it depends on the bird. Sometimes the babies of even colorful birds start out with dull feathers and grow into their bright colors as they get older. And one of my favorite birds, the flamingo, has a really cool reason for its bright color. Now, when you think of flamingos, you probably think pink. And some flamingos are definitely bright pink, but others are reddish orange or white, and some are even more than one color. Yep, it's true. A newly hatched flamingo chick is whitish gray in color, and they stay that way until they're about one year old. Then something amazing happens. They start to turn color, and the secret is in how they eat. You're right, Squeaks. It does kind of look like the flamingo is doing a headstand. Flamingos aren't showing off when they have their heads upside down, though. 
they're eating. It looks a little silly, but flamingos eat by slurping up water in their beaks. They have a structure in their beak that acts like a strainer catching pieces of food for the birds to swallow whole. You know, like the pasta strainer we have in the kitchen. They eat just about anything that they can slurp up, like tiny shrimp and insect larvae. Some of this flamingo food has what we call pigment in it. A pigment is a substance that gives things color. For example, the paint we use to make colorful pictures has different pigments in it. The pigment in flamingo food is orange colored. In fact, it's the same pigment that gives fall leaves, pumpkins, and carrots their orange color. As the flamingo eats, over time, the pigment in the food ends up in a flamingo's skin and feathers. And once it gets to the flamingo's feathers, it usually looks more pink than orange. And the more pigment that is in the food a flamingo eats, the brighter in color the flamingos get. In fact, if a flamingo stops eating food that has a lot of pigment in it, their feathers will fade back to white. So the flamingo's diet definitely causes its color. <laughs> oh, don't worry, Squeaks. Although the same pigment in the flamingo's diet is in carrots and some of the foods we eat, we're not in any real danger of turning orange. Flamingos eat thousands and thousands of larvae and shrimp every day and almost all of the flamingo's food has pigment in it. We would need to eat 10 carrots every day for a long time to start to turn orange. People eat lots of different things in their diets, not just one kind of food. And although carrots are a healthy snack, we prefer to eat a balanced diet with many different foods. Say, let's get a healthy snack and then do some more bird watching. Remember how I said that bird watching can help birds too? Well, one way bird watchers can help is by keeping an eye out for invasive bird species. Invasive species are plants and animals that end up in habitats far away from the habitat they evolved to live in. And sometimes invasive species can cause big trouble for the living things native to a habitat. By looking for invasive species early, before they spread too much, we can help keep native bird species happy and healthy. Here's more about invasive species. Hey there, Squeaks and I were just about to... What is it, Squeaks? What do you hear? A bird? Oh yeah, I hear it too. I recognize that. That's a starling. That one sounds like it's on its own, but starlings sometimes fly in huge, and I mean huge, flocks. Now, it may be hard to believe, but at one time, there were none of these birds in the United States. Nope. Not a one. But that's not the case now at all. There are millions of starlings in the United States, and they can cause some problems. For example, starlings like to eat fruit, and if a huge group of starlings gets into an orchard, well, they can eat or harm a lot of the fruit that people need. Starlings are an example of what's called an invasive species, a type of animal or plant or other living thing that gets moved to a place where it doesn't belong and causes some harm to the other types of living things that are already there. A species is a specific kind of living thing, and lots of species can only survive in certain places. For example, a spider monkey that lives in the wet rainforest isn't going to be able to live in the dry dry desert. It wouldn't be able to find the food, water, and shelter it needs to stay alive. But invasive species can survive in places other than where they originally live. And when they move in, they can cause problems for the other types of living things that aren't as flexible. That's what happened with the starlings in North America. About 130 years ago, someone brought a group of starlings to the United States from England, one of the places where they naturally live. Like many other birds, starlings use their beaks to find and get food. But starlings have beaks that are extra strong and they're so good at getting food that they can often get more food than other kinds of birds. So the group of starlings from England were able to get more food than the other birds that were already living in the United States. And the starlings were also able to get food all winter. The birds that were already here never had to deal with anything like that before. The starlings were getting and eating a lot of the food, and they weren't leaving much for the birds that were already here. When other kinds of birds went to other places to find food, the starlings moved into their nest that they left behind. When it got warmer again and the birds came back, the starlings had taken away the other birds' food 
and their houses. Then the starlings had babies, and their babies had more babies. The number of starlings grew and grew until there were tons of starlings and a lot less of the birds that were already living there. All this happened because one person brought starlings into the United States. Other times, invasive species move from one place to another accidentally. For example, the brown tree snake was accidentally taken from its home in Australia to a nearby island called Guam. Scientists think the snake might have been hiding on a ship or even on an airplane. Once the snakes got into Guam, they found lots of food to eat, like birds and small lizards. And while there were lots of animals for the snakes to eat, there were not very many animals on Guam that would eat the snakes. So the number of brown tree snakes started to grow. And the more snakes there were, the more birds and other animals got eaten. Some of the birds that were on Guam before those snakes got there are all gone now. So what can we do to stop invasive species? Well, it's not an easy problem to solve. Sometimes just paying attention is enough. For example, people have trained dogs to use their noses to check for tree snakes in ships and planes to make sure they don't accidentally get taken to other islands. Squeak says he doesn't smell any tree snakes in here either. Good to know. In general, people try to be very careful not to take wild animals and other living things from one area and let them go in another. The starlings in North America are probably here to stay, but we can use what we've learned from their story to stop other living things from becoming invasive species. Great idea, Squeaks. Squeaks thinks we should head over to the library to get some bird watching books so we can find some new bird species to go looking for. Bird watching is really fun and easy to start. All you need to do is grab some binoculars and go outside and start looking and listening. Thanks for joining us today. If you wanna keep looking at and learning about the big world around us with Squeaks, me, and all of our other friends, be sure to hit the subscribe button and we'll see you next time here at the fort.